So there's no doubt that testing your PRs is one of the most fun parts about lifting. I mean, we all love putting them on Instagram because everybody cares about how much you lift. And if you didn't post it, it never happened. But if that's all you're doing, you're wasting a big opportunity. PRs highlight our strengths and our weaknesses. So if you actually analyze that footage, you can see where your form starts to break down and where you need to get stronger. So actually film your lifts. The way a weight feels and the way it actually moves are often two very different things. And unlike you, the film doesn't lie. And don't just film your PRs. Film some of the warm-up weights. That way you can make sure your technique is solid, and if you are making any mistakes, you can fix them on the way up before you get to your actual PR weight. When you film these, be purposeful with your angles. You don't want to just film an angle because it looks cool when you're not actually going to learn anything from it. That defeats the entire purpose. Unless you're just trying to put it on Instagram, then go ahead. Since I just finished a 12-week lifting program and I already started testing my PRs, in this video we'll cover how I analyze my PRs, and hopefully you can learn something from that and apply it to your own training. Also, I'm testing out a new mic for the commentary, so bear with me and take off your headphones. Just so you know where I'm coming from, here's my deadlift PR from earlier this year in March. 475 loaded in the bar. You can see that it moves up pretty fast, and it's a solid rep, but there's a few issues that need to be fixed. Like you see here, my shoulders just shrugged back right there. Those should be in the same position the entire time. I shouldn't have to readjust there. But it's hard to tell why it's happening from this angle, which is why, like I mentioned earlier, you want to film intentionally. You don't want to just film from the front because it looks cool for the Instagram, you know? But when I filmed the next deadlift in this, when I started testing, you'll see it from the side. Where you can see all the things that are going on. Right here we got 405 in the bar. This is usually a weight where things start getting a little serious. Try to put my bell on. Depending on how fast this moves, you can usually tell how the day is going to go. I mean, I put slowish here because it's not slow by any means, but compared to how I like to move 405, that is slow for me. So I knew that I wasn't expecting too much from this day because I was moving a little slower. The move is to 425 on this next rep. As I, as I approach a deadlift, what I'm thinking about after I get my breath, I'm going to push the floor away. I'm not just going to pick the bar up. We're going to do that until it gets past your knees. Then I'm going to try to move my hips through to really get the violent hip action. Yeah, you can see that's explosive. Ish. But it's good enough to go to 450. Since I hit 475 in March, I expect it to be in about in the 500s in this next testing cycle. But let's see how this 450 goes. As you can see, that was kind of a drag. And when weights are moving that slow, sometimes you have to know that the PR is not there that day. And as sad as that is, like, could I have hit 4, 500 this day? Maybe, but it would have been ugly as hell. So, I just decided to test it again the week after. But, at least we can go back to overhead press the next day. Now that we start overhead press, we're just going to start with the PRs. So my previous PR, and this is 165. It is around last September at a friend's gym. As you can see, except for that shitty wrist positioning, it went up pretty fast. And then also, earlier in my program, I hit 175 pounds overhead with a pause. This is where I usually struggle. It's right at that place, that's why I pause there. And I grind it out there. So I expect at least to get 180 on this next testing cycle. Let's see how it goes. Here's 160 is my last warm-up weight before technically going into PRs. Start pushing away, starting to get the head through. See it locked out pretty easy. I don't think the bar path is as good because it's really out in front of me. As you can see, I have to step forward to catch it. Like right there. That shouldn't be happening. It just goes straight up. But now into 170. Get a big breath. Trying to squeeze the bar as hard as I can. Pushing up. Again, solid. This is technically a five pound PR, but I paused 175 a lot faster speed than this. So this day was not going to end pretty well from the start. As you can see from this 175 pound attempt, you're right to that sticking point. It doesn't go anywhere. Now, overhead press and deadlifts are my two favorite lifts. So when you expect to do great things with both of these and you end up sucking, you got to ask yourself why. And this isn't about making an excuse. It's about trying to be honest with yourself and really figure out what you did or didn't do. 
and I realized that I didn't do my deload. And if, for those of you who don't know what a deload is, it's basically a week or two that you take after a program before you test where you use lighter weights and give your body a chance to recover. Since I was doing a program called Conjugate where you basically work up to 100 max every single day for weeks on end, I take a toll on your body. And so I tried to skip that because I was impatient, just tried to go and test right away. I mean, I think that's all what we like to do. But I want to live for the rest of my life. So in the grand scheme of things, one week isn't really going to matter. As much as I'd like to just test right away, I'd rather wait a week and try these again and do actually good than just try them the next day and then get the same shitty result. So I did end up taking a deload. I came back the next week. I paid extra attention to my sleep and my diet. So let's see what the results of that deload really are. All right, now that we're back from the deep load, the next week, once again, a 405 in the bar. Let's see how this one moves. Give that big breath and you're ready to go. Even if it's not as fast as I'd like it to be, it's still a pretty solid rep. Much the theme with most of these, as you'll see. Nice solid lockout, so the weight is moving. And compare this 450 to the one before, you can see it's a lot more solid, it's not as much of a grind. Once you get the bar moving, you'll see it. Come on. Definitely looked a lot easier. Now we're about to move on to the final weight of the day. 450 moved decently well, so I decided to bring up the 485. It could be a 10 pound PR if I get it. And you can see that I'm kind of dancing a little bit around a little bit right now. Just getting my grip right now. Think about all my cues and just getting ready to push that bar away. When you get to weight this heavy, it's going to fight you. That yeah, guy's happy. A 10 pound PR is still a PR. Might not seem like much after working for 12 weeks, but. After a year, if you keep up that rate, that's almost 43 pounds. I mean, you keep doing that year after year, you're going to keep progressing. And as you get stronger, it's hard to put on a lot more rapid gains. Like, you're probably not going to gain 50 pounds on a deadlift in a year once you start deadlifting and it's like 600s or plus. Like, that doesn't happen. You have to be happy with the small results and enjoying the process because that's going to keep you going. Now, when we really start looking at this pull, we can see right now we're in pretty solid position. The shoulders can be a little higher up, but... Once you start applying force into the bar, the hips shoot up before the bar even really leaves the ground. And a big reason why this could be happening is the fact that my quads are weak. And since if these guys aren't strong enough to push the, the bar up, they're going to call for friends. They're going to call for all the guys on the back, all the hamstrings and your glutes. So that's why that happens. But when that happens, it shoots your shoulders forward. You can see you start nice. And then got to lean forward so you can put the hips up. That's going to this part for the rest of the pull. As you'll see, I end up having to pull my shoulders back right here because I got out of position earlier. Another reason why that could be happening is because my lats aren't engaged at the start of the pull. Now these muscles are pretty big and they're going to be responsible for holding your, your arms and your shoulders right there so that when you lock out, you just you stay in the position you wouldn't have to pull them back at the end way you can do that is by imagining either bending the bar across your shins like it's a horseshoe or by imagining taking your shoulder blade and putting it in your back pocket. I mean, this is something a lot of beginners, myself included, struggle with is the fact like if you ask somebody to flex their bicep, they know how to do it. Most people don't know how to flex their lats unless you walk around like that, but doing that will keep the shoulders a lot more tighter on the deadlift. A lot of, a lot of people try to treat this at the top and say, oh, I got a weak lockout, so I'm going to go do some rack pulls or something, you know, where you can overload the top of the movement, but that's not the problem. The problem is that I didn't get my lats tight there, or my quads are weak and my hips shot up, so that my back's in a bad position. It's something in the setup that's causing me to be messed up at the top. So to fix this, I can do some more quad exercises like squats or even some deadlift variation that use the quads a lot more like a trap bar deadlift or a deficit deadlift. As far as lats go, obviously like rows, weighted pull-ups, lat pulls, lat pull-downs, even rack pulls, but 
All that stuff's going to help me get to 500 and plus in the future. Alright, now we're going to move to my second overhead press testing day, where we hit 165 as the last warm up weight. I mean, it looks decent enough, but we're going to take a closer look. You can start seeing my feet coming up as I start to push right there. That means the bar is too far forward. It's also why it's so hard. Like, this should be a nothing weight for me. So what you're going to do is exercise. You want to keep the bar path going well because the shortest distance between two things is a straight line. And if you veer off of that line, the bar is going to feel a lot heavier. And for stuff like an overhead press or a bench press, I mean, the line's going to be a little different because you got your face, you know, it needs to be a little curved. But stuff like a deadlift, that bar needs to be moving straight up. The same for the squat. So that's why this felt a lot worse than it really should. Obviously getting the head through the window. So we try 175. Really ugly attempt right there. I'm not sure why that shoulder is higher than the other, but let's move past that. So the way my brain works, and I'm, again, I'm not very smart. I figure since I could pause this in the past, I just try to pause it again this day. Let's see how this goes. Well, we paused it. All right, let's look at these calves right here. So you can see they're trying to do a little calf raise right there. You know what that's telling me? It's telling me that the bar is way too forward. I'm trying to compensate just to get underneath the bar. That's another bar path issue. That shouldn't happen, just like the previous one. That's one of the big issues that's messing this lift up. I'm not sure if it's just a strength issue or mostly technical, but fixing that bar path and getting it more over to the midline of my body will make this weight feel easier. And also, it's the same sticking point. And since that is still where my sticking point is, there are a few ways that I'm going to attack this. First, I'm going to get more practice with the movement to get that bar path where it should be in a perfect straight line. Also, I'm going to get my shoulders and my triceps so strong that no matter how many technical mistakes I make, I can still just force that bar up. Then, a more specific way to attack this particular sticking point is with the pause that I showed earlier, where you get it to right there and try to push it up past that. I might also try a multi-layer pause where I push it a little lower and a little higher. That way so I can't cheat the movement. Another fun way to do this is to take the safety bars and put them right there and do what's called a pin press. Where you're actually going to start the motion at the point where you stall. And that way you can really overload that position and get stronger there. But I wouldn't do any one of these by themselves. I would do them all in, in conjunction. So that way you can cover all angles and really break through this sticking point. All right, we're well past the 10-minute mark, so I'm about to sign off. Part 2 of Squat and Bench will be out next week, and I'll try to fix the audio issue between now and then. Thank you for watching, and hope you learned something.